A massive US naval fleet looms on the horizon. On the other side, an alliance of European Union ships awaits, ready to deny the Americans the Eastern Atlantic. Soon thereafter, a massive battle ensues, with a dozen carriers, dozens of submarines and countless planes fighting it out. That's what could happen if the US and the European Union suddenly went to war with each other. The two superpowers total almost 800 million souls together. The great expanse of the Atlantic Ocean is between them. So how would such a war be waged? And which side could take away their opponent's territories? If people learned from history, maybe there would be fewer wars. We all want to better ourselves and learn more. With the help of Blinkist, which is sponsoring this video, learning can be quite quick. Blinkist offers you summarized non-fiction books. Basically a group of curators and editors pick and condense interesting books on a myriad of topics, like history and economics, technology, biographies and many more. You can either read or listen to the book's blinks. Most books are condensed to just 15 to 20 minutes. A short history of Brexit, for example, gives well summed up blinks. In case you'll wonder why our feature video doesn't include the UK within the EU. Also, Blinkist offers full-length audiobooks and premium subscribers get special pricing. Naval nerds may find on Wave and Wink interesting, like me. That book details the history of aircraft carrier developments. If you want to learn quickly, give Blinkist a try and click below. A 7-day trial is completely free and you can cancel at any time. The first 100 people using the link will get 25% off a full membership and unlimited one-week access. Now let us continue our scenario, the first of a two-part video series. The two sides are divided by the Atlantic, which is pretty big, which means reacting far away from one's home bases isn't very easy. The EU could not realistically protect its faraway overseas assets, such as some Caribbean islands, French Guiana, various Pacific and Indian Ocean islands and so on. Oh, and to make it clear, the rules of this scenario are, no other countries can participate in any way, no nukes are used and starting morale is the same for all. If hostilities started in just a few hours, with no warning, US bases across Europe would be trapped. For now, the scenario will assume that wouldn't happen and a pullout of forces before the war would be possible. More about the other option in the second video. If the EU wanted to hurt the US on US territory, it would first have to sail there. Reaching the Western Atlantic would be theoretically doable, but hard, as it would mean meeting the might of the US Navy. Surviving to reach the US assets elsewhere, like in the Pacific, would be all but impossible. The EU doesn't even have the network of sufficient support bases and underway replenishment ships needed for such massive operations, to support dozens of ships, months at a time. In practice, the European naval fleet would likely be sunk halfway to the US, in the Atlantic, if it tried to reach it. As soon as it moved out of the protection of land-based aircraft, US air supremacy would take its toll. Spanish and Italian carriers have much more capacity than they have carrier-compatible jets. The Spanish ship, or one of the Italian ones, might not thus carry planes. Facing such paltry fighter numbers, the US fleet would reign victorious with its numerous aircraft carriers. The US Navy and Marine Corps do have more than enough planes to fill out all of the 20 carriers two times over. But on short notice, there would be fewer jets available, in reality even fewer than 600 for the US and 50-ish for the EU, due to maintenance requirements for the carriers. With all its reserve and training planes, the US inventory is much bigger, and US land-based aircraft would enter the fray as well, as the EU fleet approaches. So it's pretty evident it's the EU that would be on defense here, with its fleet hugging its coasts and being protected by its land-based aircraft. Another reason why the European fleet would most likely operate defensively is that its ships were primarily designed for such roles. US ships are on the average quite a bit larger than the EU ones. Small ships of under 2000 tons as well as fast attack missile boats, which Europe also uses, would struggle to even operate in the Atlantic properly. But the same small attack boats and corvettes could be still lethal in certain circumstances when defending a coast or an archipelago. Which brings us to the more important issue than comparing pure numbers. Just what territories would the EU defend? 
as said the Caribbean and other farther away lands would be indefensible. But there are some territories closer to Europe that the EU would likely draw a line at. Near North Africa there are the Spanish-owned and thus EU-owned Canary Islands. A little bit to the north are the Portuguese Madeira Islands. All those are quite a bit away from the European mainland, so protecting those would not be easy. But perhaps even more vulnerable would be the Portuguese-owned Azores, with the westernmost islands of the archipelago being over a thousand miles away. The Azores would be perfect basis for further US conquests. There are other areas that might get threatened as well, but let's stick to all these islands for now. Spain and Portugal have infrastructure for a token force on each archipelago, roughly a brigade worth of troops, a SAM battery and a small detachment of jet fighters. Ports could also help supply a certain smaller number of ships. Commercial airports could house a few hundred jets if need be. Repurposing airports and militarizing the islands would take months, but the US too would need months to gather its Pacific and Atlantic fleets into one massive naval force. Then again, putting too many eggs in one basket in the middle of the Atlantic might not be too prudent for the EU. In a way, cramming too many jets onto those island bases might be dangerous for Europe, as losses on the ground might be bigger than, or too many planes might simply be trapped, unable to take off. The US could also count on a sizable number of US Air Force jets, especially over the Azores, helped by its massive aerial tanker fleet. US mainland based fighter jet receiving fuel three or so times could perform strike missions over that archipelago. Of course, when most of the 12 hour mission is transit time, the sortie rate and availability rate might be halved. But that wouldn't be an issue for the US Air Force so much, as it has plenty of spare planes compared to the European Air Force. EU's forces are smaller than the complete US list shown, but as said in local terms over the Azores, they might still outnumber the Americans. But unlike the US fleet, where pretty much all jets except A-10s have decent air-to-air -air capabilities, the European fleets have plenty of single-roll strike planes, without meaningful air-to-air -air capabilities. Obsolescent MiGs-21 and F-5s aren't mentioned, but even Harriers, MiG-29s and older Mirage 2000s would be quite lacking in capabilities. The EU does have decent aerial tanker assets, so keeping some planes based in Spain, for example, but having them patrol over the Azores would not be impossible. The problem would be, however, that if one wants to upkeep a patrol 24-7 from afar, that would be terribly inefficient. Basically, the EU would be spending almost its entire fighter force that way, with no guarantee of a successful defense in the long term, as its numbers would still be behind the US in the Atlantic it is very likely the EU would thus not choose to defend the Azores and the Canaries at all cost. A quick digression, when it comes to the defense industry, the US is quite self-reliant. The EU less so. In shipbuilding, the EU mostly uses its own sourced components. The same goes for ground vehicles. But when it comes to aircraft, there would be some issues for some producers. Gripen production would be greatly hampered until some US sourced components could be replaced. A lot of existing systems in EU armies are US made as well, so maintaining them in the long run might be an issue. This goes for plentiful F-16s, F-18s, Black Hawk helicopters and such. Getting replacement precision bombs might take longer, as many of the current ones are US sourced. So crash course integration of French designed weapons might be needed. Anyway, the battles would be fought under the sea surface as well. The US has a huge fleet of submarines. They are all nuclear fueled, which means they are fast, they have unlimited endurance and they are quiet. A third of the fleet is pretty modern too, with subs made in the last quarter century. The Ohio's would likely be held back from the front lines, due to their more strategic nature. The EU submarine fleet is smaller and not designed for fast offensive warfare. Only France has nuclear subs. The rest of the fleet is a hodgepodge of various types. Old German Type 207s and 209s, but also new Type 214s, indigenous Dutch and French made older subs, but also modern Swedish ones, and even one Russian Kilo class sub. So the EU would most likely send only a token force of its submarines near the Azores. They would strike only when they see a clear opportunity, which would be seldom. Waiting in ambush near EU territories, on the other hand, 
they could leverage their design strengths and minimize their weaknesses, and be just as quiet as the US subs on average, though the overall technological edge might still be somewhat on the US side. Actual US numbers of aerial anti-submarine platforms operating near actual EU countries would be quite a bit less than shown, though. That being said, with no easy way to assure aerial supremacy, the EU would find it hard to suppress American anti-submarine assets. So the underwater fight would likely be dictated a bit more by the US than the EU forces. The US Navy would not likely see large losses as long as it keeps away from EU islands. But in taking the Azores, the Canaries and so on, the US would have to place its amphibious ships very close, which means also placing protective ships close as well. Suddenly, instead of having to search a huge part of the ocean to find targets, the EU would more or less know where the US ships are. As said, the EU would have to split their forces to defend other territories as well. The US would almost certainly go for Greenland as well. The US already has some bases on Greenland, and both Denmark and US upkeep a few hundred military personnel on the island. Greenland is pretty barren though, with very limited infrastructure, so actually operating many ships or aircraft from there would first require months of construction. The climate in the coastal regions of Greenland is cold but decent enough. Those regions are often without snow cover, and temperatures are bearable during most of the year. Given the proximity to the US and the lack of the EU force projection, it is very unlikely the EU would try hard to defend Greenland. Since there would be plenty of areas that might get attacked by the US, the EU would likely consolidate its forces on defending just the key areas – the EU mainland and one overseas country – Ireland. It has to be pointed out that the whole scenario of this video very much depends on a single postulate – that the EU acts unified. Right now, each country has its own foreign policy and own defense policy. Without a unified front in those areas, the EU would be visibly weaker. Also, while the US military trains in unison, various EU countries don't have as much experience in training together or cooperation. Ireland, unlike the Azores and Canaries, is more defensible. It has ample infrastructure, it's much closer to bases in France, providing layered defenses. The Faroe Islands would also likely be protected at all costs. Similar to Greenland, they are an autonomous Danish region, but closer to the EU. Still, given their isolated nature, they might eventually fall to the US, if America tries hard enough. Going after Ireland would be very hard. The distance from the mainland US is considerable. After a few months, newly constructed US bases on Greenland would help to an extent. But bases on the occupied Azores and Canaries would be key. It is very likely that the US Air Force would have a few hundred planes stationed less than 1500 miles from Ireland, with several hundred more occasionally operating from the mainland US with the help of aerial tankers, and a few hundred more of carrier-based planes. Months would pass as the US establishes control over the Atlantic, and many ships would need maintenance, so for further ops near Ireland, fresh ships would be needed, which means only a part of the US carrier fleet would ever be in battle theater at any one time. The US has pretty big airborne and amphibious assault forces, but whether they are big enough to help take Ireland, especially after some prior losses on the Atlantic Islands, is another matter. Everything described up to this point would take time, months easily, over half a year likely. Air attacks on Ireland would increase gradually before an assault attempt, so the EU would really have half a year to turn Ireland into a self-sufficient fortress. The Republic of Ireland has some 5 million residents. It is also consistently near the top of the most self-sufficient countries when it comes to food. Adding half a million or more EU troops to Ireland and supporting them would likely not be much of an issue, especially since the US would be unable to completely close off the influx of goods to Ireland. But definitely that supply corridor from France to Ireland would be under near constant naval and air attacks. If the US tried to keep the corridor fully closed, it would have to actually park a huge chunk of its navy there, and that would mean whatever ships are there would be constantly exposed to EU attacks. It would be an unwise move that could cause the US unsustainable and inexcusable losses. Before the landing, the Agin cruise missiles would definitely come handy to the US. 
the EU has far fewer and it's likely it would save up most of them for sporadic harassment of US bases on the Azores and the Canaries. It has to be said that the cruise missiles would not be used by either side in doomsday salvos. Neither side could actually have enough launching platforms in range to unleash a thousand missiles at once. And the number of targets in the EU is staggering, which would likely mean the US too would use its missiles on select targets, like the island bases, Spanish, Portuguese and French ports, select air bases and of course the Republic of Ireland as a whole, certainly hindering both the EU's resupply efforts over the sea and the EU's presence in the air. But more about the end war and the invasion of Ireland in the second part of our video series. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.